Then let me just begin. I must say I, I dedicate this talk to Thomas, uh, Thomas Arst. I begin with reading from Libra Notus. Your soul is in great need because drought weighs on its world. If you look outside yourselves, you see the far off forest and mountains and above them, your vision climbs to the realms of the stars. And if you look into yourselves, you will see on the other hand that the nearby as far off and infinite, since the world of the inner is as infinite as the world of the outer. Just as you become a part of the manifold essence of the world through your bodies, so you become a part of the manifold essence of the inner world through your soul. This inner world is truly infinite, in no way poorer than the outer one. Man lives in two worlds. End quote. In personal preface, let me say, it was, well, 35 years ago, exactly one half of my life ago, that I first began my intense engagement with Dr. Young. Over the years since, I have tried to better understand the man and his vision. And then, to the degree I was capable, to share some of that understanding with others. And I know many of you here have been doing the same. When I first uh, entered into my study, and it was an intense dive down the rabbit hole, I would add, uh, when I first began my study at Young 35 years ago, my mentor was Dr. Stefan Heller. Uh, Stefan was, and still remains at age 90, a remarkable scholar of both the work of C.G. Jung and of historical Gnostic traditions. And after these many years, I, well, he still remains my dearest friend. At my, the beginning of my journey with Jung, Dr. Heller suggested I closely read and consider the Septum Sermones Ad Mortos, the Seven Sermons to the dead, which Jung had privately print, uh, printed in 1916. Behind that text, uh, Stefan, Dr. T Dr. Heller counseled me that there was clearly a hidden visionary background. The Septum Sermones are like a high mountain peak rising above clouds. That singular revelatory test text was evidence of a vast range of visionary experiences, material probably in his red book and black birch book, book journals, which then was material we supposed we would never see. And Dr. Heller advised me 
understand Jung in the light of that background, a background that may be obscured from the view of some, but most certainly existed. Throughout subsequent uh, decades, I was continually reading Jung backwards, back to that, that hidden experience, back to what must have been the foundation of all, he later said. It was at times like an archeological expedition, finding bits of evidence, shards of things I could tentatively assemble around what had happened to the man. So as, as a doctor and as, as an historian, my fundamental interest was and remains the experience at the root of Jung's work, the period of his life that was elusively called his confrontation with the unconscious. And Jung said in later life, quote, the years when I pursued the inner images were the most important time of my life. Everything else is to be derived from this. It began at that time. And the later details hardly matter anymore. The numinous beginning, which contained everything, was then, then. So the epical publication in 2009 of the Red Book, Libra Novus, finally opened a vista upon the imaginal visionary world Jung had traversed during those formative years. It was when I first opened and read it, and I started that task on October 9th of 2009 when I got my book in New York. It was it was pretty much what I had expected and much more. Then, like many of you, I've studied it in detail. I've given long seminars about it. I've written several papers centered on its revelation, its contents, and what happened to dear Dr. Yoon during those years. Nonetheless, Libra Novus is still only one part of Jung's story. A recension of the van fantasies that opened to him between you know, the fall of 1913 and the spring of 1914, then amplified by his later commentary is composed largely in later 1914 and, and 1915. And then, then there's the, 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 the manuscript draft of the last section of the volume scrutinies which Jung composed in 1917, adding material from experiences he had had in late 1915 on through 1916. But there was more. Jung's imaginal or visionary journey continued for several more years. And those experiences, were also mysteriously entwined with all the art found in the second half of the folio red book. Publication in two, uh, 2020, interesting year, 2020, Jung's private journals, the black books, 1913 to 1932, provide completion to the tale of Jung's nearly two decade, decade journey in division, fantasy, and imagination. And the journals are essential to understanding Jung's journey of transformation. And here I, I, I must add, we are all indebted to Dr. Sono Shamdashani for his untiring labor and the many sacrifices and trials born over more than two decades to bring these crucially important works to the world. 
It was a Herculean task of scholarship, fortitude, and devotion. And all of us here now and for generations to come owe him profound gratitude. Finding God. In the time remaining, I will focus upon one recurrent theme in Jung's visionary venture, his search to apprehend the ultimate mystery of divinity as he met it in evolving visionary and imaginative and fantastic forms during his experiential journey with the inner world. He explained, if you look into yourselves, you will see the nearby as far off and infinite. Since the world of the inner is as infinite as the world of the outer. This inner world is truly infinite, infinite. That affirmation was a keystone arching above Jung's thoughts, writings and reflections for the rest of his life. In later life, he often used the word psyche to speak of this inner infinite. And of this infinite, he said, psyche can function as though space did not exist. The psyche can thus be independent of space, of time, of causality. This explains the possibility of magic. Unquote. And for you, the psyche was both the boundless underpinnings of consciousness and its infinite, timeless, primal source. In commentary on the Tibetan book of the Great Liberation composed for Evan Wentz back in 1939, Jung asserted, and I quote, the psyche is therefore all important. It is the all pervading breath. It is the Buddha essence. It is the Buddha mind, the one, the Dharmakaya. All existence emanates from it and all separate forms dissolve back into it, unquote. Later life thoughts. One must, however, step back to the beginning and comprehend that when Jung started his venture in 1913, what he termed in December 1913 uh, to be my most difficult experiment, he had no help where he was going or what would follow. It was an expedition into an infinite unknown. So in comments here, I'll mostly be referencing Jung's writings in the Black Book journals. The journals are nightly text record, unedited. I have read them many times. They offer raw evidence of the evolution of Jung's journey with his fantasies and visions. And after 1916, from the beginning of 1916 onward, they offer much more detail about his quest to understand the nature of divinity. A journey of understanding that extended for years beyond the last pages of the Red Book, Libra Novus, as we have it. Again, remember the beginning. On the night of 14 November 1913, two nights after his quest began, he called out to his soul, quote, who are you, child? You know that you have used this image in my dreams, the image of a little girl. 
and I found you again only through the soul of the woman. How dare I guess about this? What do I know of your mystery? Forgive me if I speak as in a dream, like a drunkard. Are you God? Is God a child, a female child? Unquote. Was God a child dwelling in man? In Jung's journey into this interiority, he was bon pondering what God was in relationship to humankind. And the mystery opens slowly in the next months, layer by layer. On 12 December 1913, he entered into a fantasy world and he descended into that fantasy image of the cave. And most of you know this section of the text, so I'm not going to repeat these things. But then 10 days later, on the 22 December of 1913, the doors of perception swung wide open. In his journal, on the threshold of that night's events, he started his account asking, and I quote, and here you just have to imagine a man sitting at his desk in, in his Kunstock office. What am I going to write? Everything is dark in front of me. It is the gate to darkness. Who enters here enters as poor or stupid one. Because what we call knowledge here is ignorance. Seeing is blindness, hearing deafness, feeling dullness. End of quote. And again, these are comments in the journal that. that we do not find transposed into Libra Novus. And it's this raw nature of the, of the journals, which I find so compelling. Well, the events that is ensued that evening, 22 December, 1913, following those introductory words and visions that continued over three nights, Jung called his mystery. On the third eye, night of the visions, Jung finds himself stretched out as if on a cross and wrapped in a serpent, blood streaming from his body. And Salome proclaims to him, you are Christ. Hmm. That might make you wonder a bit about the nature of divinity, might it? Again, most of you who know that know that scene from the Red Book, and I'm not going to recount it anymore. But it's all recorded in the journals of those nights, too. And as I said, I find that journal account offers a more intense and immediate entry into the happenings than does his edited and commented rendition of the vision in Libra Novus. In, in the 1920s, June described what he had experienced in the Mysterium as specifically a vision. The intensity, the visual qualities of this indicate a presence in this vision, a complete entry. He had entered a visionary world. And from Christmas 1913 onward, forward over the next few months, many more such imaginative or visionary or fantastic encounters followed. And some of them, of course, were highly visual in quality. Others were more dialogic. And they came quickly in February and January of 14, and then slowed down a bit by spring, and by the coming of spring, faded more and more away. 
vision, fantasy, imagination. Find your own words to describe what he recorded in his journals. And the words God, Christ, Christianity appear well over a thousand times in Libra Notes. Those words are also, of course, present in the first journals from 1913 and 1914. But they became even more frequent in the commentary Jung wrote in his draft manuscript of Libra Notes, composed in 1914 and 1915, when he was offering thoughts about what had happened the prior year. He spoke therein about no, no longer being a Christian, but a Christ. He envisioned the end of the Christian aeon, the coming of a new age, the fourth month of history. The way, this common them, the way, the way of what was to come. Finding ancient friends. By 1915, as he began creating the calligraphic red book folio, Jung was seriously searching for evidences in history that his peculiar, visionary, revelatory, and imaginal, fantastic experience, use whatever words fit for you, was not unprecedented, unprecedented. Of course, what he had experienced was beyond the ken of most men, most people of his age. And it appears the place he first found historical record of similar mythopoetic imagination was in the suppressed Gnostic writings of the early Christian age, particularly those that had been recorded by a fellow by the name of Hippolytus, writings that were later condemned as heresy. Jung was investigating and reading all of our available remnants of Gnostic material from January 1915 onward. And I could point out to you the book, I think, that excuse me, was most important to him in this period. It's still on the shelf. And I, uh, I won't tell you that story, but it, it is a, one of the most marked books, one of the most annotated books in Jung's entire library. And he was struck by how much this ancient material echoed the mythopoetic qualities of his own visions. What he perce apparently perceived in his writings was an Im imaginative entry into the timeless train he had begun to traverse. And yes, those old heretical writings were couched in another age the beginning of the Christian age. Yes, they were ultimately suppressed and renounced as heresy, but in them he heard echoes of mythopoetic experiences similar to his own. Now I wrote a, a long forward to Dr. Alfred Ribby's book, The Search for Roots, CGU and the Tradition of Gnosis, um, a book I edited and, and helped publish in uh, 2013. And in that long forward, I detailed Jung's study of Gnostic materials in this age, and I did so lots of footnotes, footnotes in great detail. So that forward is available online in several places if you want to see it. I, I can't review this wide-ranging material here, but I will add one other note. Um, after having done a couple of seminars, a one-year-long seminar on the Red Book, in Easter of um, two, uh, 2015, I had to do a, quite a bit of editorial work on my archive of, of the Nozos archive of the, of the non-Jamaldi texts. And over, uh, over really a couple of decades, I had collected permissions from some of the major scholars who had done translations of these original Gnostic Coptic texts. And I had 20 very fine translations that I needed to take from paper and put into the internet. And I had to read this stuff. I had to edit it. I had to, you know, format it for inclusion in, into the library form, formats, the library materials. And I've got to tell you, after spending, at that point, six years with Libra Novus, with the Red Book, 
as I read these old Gnostic texts, I heard them in an entirely new way. They became alive to me in ways that they, well, I knew what the stuff was. I knew what was there. But there was a life in them that I found highly similar to the stuff I had been doing with Jung for the last six years. And at that point, it was like, aha, I see what Jung was seeing, perhaps. I'll say no more of that. So by mid-1916, summer of 1916, Jung had started his Red Book. He was pages into his transcription and into the, in, in, into the folio volume. And one supposes he thought his visionary venture was done. What remained to him was transcribing exegesis, understanding, psychological explications of his experience in text for himself and then perhaps in some published form for others. Well, then in late summer, 1915, it started again. Philemon returned. The imaginal world reopened, but it now took a very different, deeper turn. And some of this material, but not all of it, some of it is in Libra Novus. But much more appears in his journals from fall of 1915 onward through the early 1920s. And during this period, Jung's conception of what he was doing became much more complex. And now Gnostic mythic motifs clearly amplified his own private mythopoetic imagination. In January, January 16th, 1916, as recorded in his journal, an intense vision of divinity and the multitude complexities of divinity was spoken to you by his soul. It is a truly extraordinary text, so extraordinary that Dr. Shambhasan Sani apparently insisted this one section of Jung's Black Book Journals be included as an appendix to the published edition of, of Libra Novus. And of course, one must understand that at that time, 15 years ago, when publication of Libra Novus was being finalized, it was, of course, still quite uncertain if any portions of Jung's Black Book journals would ever be revealed or published. Nonetheless, Shamdasani knew this section of Jung's journal needed to be included, and it appears as Appendix C in Libra Novus, and it's found in the Black Book journals, Book 5 on pages 163 to 78, if you want to go looking at the script. In this revelation, Jung's soul speaks in the voice of Sophia, as she appears in Gnostic mythology. And she warns him of the Demiurge, a signal motif of Gnostic mythology, the ruler of this world. Here, the name of the Demiurge spoken by his soul is Abraxas a name which was reformed in the text of Libra Novus as ruler of this world, an appropriate translation in, in, in terms of Gnostic mythology. And he was an immense and powerful, but lesser deity. Let me share a small section of Jung's text from that journal of the 16th June, January, 1916. It's quite long. I'm here uh, appending a bit. And I read. I think that's. I think that uh, share came through. Did it not? Let me see. Oh yeah, here we go. You should worship only one God. Are you seeing the share there? Yes, we are. Okay, good. Um, you should worship only one God. The other gods, gods are unimportant. Abraxas is to be feared. 
Therefore, it was a deliverance when he separated himself from me. And here is Sola speaking as Sophia. You do not need to seek him. He will find you, just like Eros. He is the god of the cosmos, extremely powerful and fearful. He is the creative drive. He is form and formation, just as much as matter and force. Therefore, he is above all the light and dark gods. He tears away souls and casts them into procreation. He is the creative and the created. He is the God who renews himself in days and months and years and human life and ages and people and the living in heavenly bodies. He compels. He is unsparing. If you worship him, you increase his power over you. You must be in the middle of life, surrounded by death on all sides, stretched out like one crucified. You hang in him, the fearful, the overpowering. But you have in you the one God. The wonderfully beautiful and kind, the solitary, star-like, unmoving, he who is older and wiser than the father, he who has a safe hand, who leads you among all the darknesses and death scares of dreadful Abraxas. He gives joy and peace since he is beyond death and beyond what is subject to change. He is no servant and no friend of Abraxas. And I end quote there. Can you hear that text? And not comprehend the power of Jung's evolving vision of deity? Echoed there one finds motifs and images from a sympathetic reading of Gnostic mythopoetic vision. But these are not ancient myths myths from the past. He had met something in his present in the timelessness of the psyche and was giving voice to it in his own way. And it is as at this time in his um, black book that he began this first, call it a londo if you wish, that certainly was the a term you would have used at that time. It's a psychocosmology. In which he was taking all of these things that had been coming to him and trying to draw into it an image of, well, the infinite. The facts of the inner world, the deities. I deeply dislike the term um, collective unconscious. Uh, I think it's, it just doesn't work for me. Objective psyche, if you wish. Archetypal realm, well, this is what he meant. And he was trying to define the vastness of these things that had been descending upon him during this period. And this period in January of 1916, one simply must understand, was undescribably difficult. A difficult visionary period for Jung. Two days after that um, mandala, those texts from 1916 that his uh, soul had spoken, he wrote in his journal, men flee in horror from me, since I bear the marks of fire. My God, why have you forsaken me? Oh, horrendous silence. His soul responds. You have waited long enough. The holy fire is blazing. Step into the flames. Jung asks, 
what should I proclaim? The fire? The soul responds, the flame that blazes over your head. Look up. The skies redden. And then on January 30th of 1916, 12 days later, and this is then apparently when he felt the invading spirits of the dead all around him, that story told in memories, dreams, reflections. He petitioned his soul. You need to bring some relief. Speak a redeeming word. What's up with the spirits? They're tearing at me. And I'm having difficulty standing. His soul speaks to him in one word. Surrender. And on the next line of his journal, page 192 of Journal 5, Black Book Journal 5, Jung began addressing the dead. Those are the words that are the beginning of what became the Septim Sermon, there's a lot more to close, the seven sermons to, to the dead. And the handwriting on those pages of the journal is fast and frantic. In the published journal, you will see the wild cursive on the, on the facsimile page, his rapid attempt to report what was transpiring. Over eight subsequent nights, he continued his sermons to the dead. And how this all transpired is quite a bit more complex than the story Agnella Yaffe gave in her, his, in her memoir of Jung, Memories, Dreams, Reflection. It's been more complex than Jung, Jung himself reflect, re related uh, the story later. But all of this, you know, it's, uh, oh, this is his first um, text manuscript of his, of his uh, Septum Ceremonies on Mortals. Uh, I think this was probably prepared in preparation for the printing, which happened in early 1916. Excuse me, not early, late 1916. Oh, and I should just probably put on this fact. When Jung was doing the final transcriptions and the printing of the seven sermons to the dead, the Battle of the Somme had begun January 1st, or excuse me, July 1st, 1916 a battle that over the next four months would produce 1.2 million casualties, at least 300,000 dead. It was a dark time, a dark time in the world that Jung brought forth this little text privately. So look, all of this is documented in his dated diaries. And interestingly, 70 years later, after that night of January 30, 1916, half of my own lifetime ago, it was that text described by, transcribed by Jung between 30 January and perhaps 8 February 1916 that piloted my course across decades of investigation as I sought to understand C.G. Jung. And I suppose that little Gnostic treatise is what brought me here speaking to you today. It has special meaning to me. Let me move on. Let me talk about art and the puzzle of Jung and his image of the divinity as it was progressing, particularly in this critical period from 1916 on through 1918. Now, Jung is a, is a puzzle that needs careful attention if one will assemble the whole. It was during this period of early 1916, during the time he heard the above words of his soul and began transcribing his sermons to the dead, that he was painting what I consider some of the most beautiful pages of Libra Novus, the Red Book. During this period, Jung was meeting and again reflecting upon his story of Istabar. Now, 
the God he had poisoned with his toxic modernity, the God he then attempted to resurrect. That story had imaginally emerged and been recorded in his journals exactly two years before in January of 1914. And he began working on these exquisite pages of the Red Book at that time, Christmas 1915, on through the months of 1916. These same months, when he was dealing with the dead, the images of God, writing the septum ceremonies. Do you see how this, this plays out? These, this puzzle, these pages, I mean, while painting those beautiful leaves about the story of Ishmael, which go from folio 36 to 64 in the calligraphic volume, and images and words I find among the most magical and artistic pages of his red book. And while composing his incantations inscribed there unto the renewal of God, he was at the same time meeting the task demanded by his soul to speak, to surrender, and to talk to dead, to the dead about the nature of divinity. Place it together. This is part of understanding what this man was going through. But there are several other. This, these are just a few pages, I just in, exquisite pages from the Red Book painted during this period when he was working on the story of the resurrection of his Dubar. But there's several other private paintings Jung created in this period. Paintings most people had never seen until, found, until the foundation published the art of C.G. Jung a few years ago. I had first seen one of these paintings over 18 years ago before the publication of the Notes by many years, and it absolutely astounded me. The painting was called Septum Ceremonies, Ad Mortos. And in that painting, I found evidence of all of Jung was offering to the world in 1916 and 17. And these paintings here, I'll show you also just the power of Jung's revelation as he expressed it in image. And of course, one, if you know anything of you know how important painting and image, the use of one's hands and imaginal evocation of vision in image was. So this is the first image I saw. It's table, it's titled he set them ceremonies like more close. I believe Jung painted this in 1917. The date is unsure. He gave it to uh, H.G. Baines, Peter Baines, who translated the Seven Sermons to the Dead into English and was published in English in 1925. Look at this thing. I, I have to tell you another story. Uh, Thomas Arts. Uh, I sent Thomas a picture of this, a picture, a copy of this picture, for himself, him to frame in his office as I have one framed on my wall right here in my office. Um, and uh, uh, and I, you know, then he asked me when that we were talking about this symposium, if he thought it possible we could use this, uh, this, this art. I told him who to contact. I, I was quite unsure about that. And well, you've seen it. Look at this, just look at this. This is an offering. I know in, if, if any of you know the old Latin Catholic mass, there is a, a, a moment, an offertorium, where the celebrant holds a golden patent plate, often served like that, that holds the real and symbolic presence of divinity and raises it up. And in that moment, in the mass, the servants at side, the servers kneel in postures such as that. But look what that patent holds. Do you see? Blood. 
Whose blood? Jung's. The blood of his life. And then above in the image, we see this little figure who came to be known as Philemon, or Telesphoros, the new born God. The cross, the patent, the blood. But over here to the side, you see these two figures. You, it's hard to see. This is Philemon here. You can barely see this in representation. This is Ka over here, these two figures, each with a symbol. And here in this image, um, you'll see that uh, Philemon is holding a text. And if you can read it, it says, Sermon Ad Mortis, the servant to the dead, which is why this, you know, that's why that painting is called the Septim Seminars Ad Mortis. Oh my, when I saw that painting, I trembled. I knew how you felt about his offering. His offering of the text, the seven sermons to the dead, to the world was. But then the thing I was most amazed by, that this was not a singular painting. This was not a one-off. He did the painting several other times. And of course, I had never seen these until uh, The Art of Fiji was published by the foundation, I think it was 19, or 2018. Here again, the image, the offering. Here you'll notice the fellow is holding in his hand, oh, to the side here again, Philemon and Ka, each with symbols I, I won't have time to express here. And notice he's holding in his hand first a serpent, which appears to have the head of a female holding a candle of light, and here a dove, the serpent and the dove and the cross. And oh, if you look closely at the cross, you'll see it is entwined in the coils of a serpent. But that wasn't it. There's another one, this one. And if you look at this, this image again, there is this vessel of offering, the patent, the sacred vessel holding the offering. And look at look at the image. Look at the symbolic elements: the cross, the circle, equal arm cross and circle. I mean, this these images have the sense of an ancient Gnostic celebration, something from the past that was playing upon Jung's imagination. And of course, this fellow looks very much like Philemon right here. This is another image. I mean, it's actually a better photo I took of the actual painting itself, which is, as you can tell, highly chipped. Look. So you see in the art, in his image, you're getting an image of his own devotion, to this thing that is coming forth from him and his service he is making to what he would imagine or consider to be his revelation. So the coming of Fanes. So, you know, Jung's image of divinity is going through all of these evolutions from, you know, asking his soul, are you God? Is God a young maiden? On through the complexities that we find in the psychocosmologies of the, of the Sistema Munditorius, the, the complexities of the Black Book, the ambiguities of Abraxas, who we now know is no god of Jung, but a powerful force nonetheless. And then the images of Fanes begin to really develop in his Black Book journals. And again, this is stuff 1917 and onward, which you really don't find explicated in Libra Novus. And it is critical to understand the evolution of God's God image. And I'm coming to the end of my remarks here. I think I'm, I'm getting close to 45 minutes. Time is running, yeah. So I'm about there. So in in September 19, in September 1917, uh, Philemon describes Phanes thus: Phanes, the god who rises a gleam from the waters. Phanes is the smile of dawn. Phanes is the resplendent day. He is the immortal present. He is promise and fulfillment. He is the light that illuminates every darkness. He is the benevolent and gentle. 
he is salvation. He is the friend of man, the light emanating from man, the bright glow that holds man on his path. He is the greatness of man, man, his force, his worth. And this figure, Fanes, here an image in the Red Book, here an image that Jung painted. Now, he painted actually duplicate images of Fanes here, one for Tony Wolf, one for Emma Jung. It was complex. Um, that Fanes is actually becoming this image of the newborn God for you. Uh, this evolution. So if you were to ask in 1918, the, the image of, of, of the new God, it is much like Fanes, but Fanes was the God new. And if you go back to those first statements in 14 uh, November, 1914, where Jung asked his soul, is God a child? a female child and man, God is coming in to Jung's conception as a child being born in us, a child who may actually be unconscious until we bring that life of the divinity into us. Now, I'm going to stop right there. Oh, I have more to say, but I'm not going to do it here with one thought, with one thought. You know, I, I titled this uh, lecture, uh, The Alchemist's Apprentice, Vision, Imagination, and the Mysterium Conjunctionis. I haven't told you why. You're the alchemist's apprentice. You. This goes back to a, a, a very brief comment in, in Mysterium Conjunctionis, the last of the four great books you wrote in, this, in, this, in a critical period after his near death. Uh, visions in 1944. And Jung talks about the problem of the his students. And he says, you know, and I hear a quote, they at, the analyst's guidance in helping to understand the statements of his unconscious and dreams, etc., may provide necessary insight. But when it comes to the question of real experience, the analyst can no longer help him. He the alchemist's apprentice himself must put his hand to the work. He is then in the position of an alchemist's apprentice who is inducted into the teaching of teachings by the master and learned all the tricks of the laboratory. But sometime he must set about the opus himself. For as the alchemist alchemists emphasized nobody else can do it for him the great mystery of conjunctionis for you the nature the essence is the conjunction of the inner and the outer the imaginal and the real the absurd and the rational as apprentices of this great alchemist. We will never know much of these images other than to see them. We will not know their source unless we put our own hand to the work. And that is the challenge you gave in Paris, paragraph 752 of Mysterium Conjunctionis, which I have always considered a key. Sometimes, the apprentice must set about the opus himself. And that is the challenge I make to those of you who will follow as apprentices after this great alchemist, Carl Gustav Jung. Thank you very much for your time. 